What's going on guys welcome back in today's video we're going to complete a simple machine learning slash data science challenge on Kaggle where the goal is to predict Titanic survivors based on certain features and I personally think that this is the perfect beginner example or the perfect beginner challenge for those of you who already know some machine learning for example you know how to build basic classification models you know how to do a train test split uh, you know how to do basic regression maybe you even know some more intermediate stuff like cross validation grid search and so on um, but you've never really done an actual data science project or an actual data science challenge. I think this is the perfect hello world type of example or hello world type of project challenge here uh, to get started with this work. And the basic idea is the following. If we go to data here, we're going to see that the data is structured into a trained CSV and into a test CSV, which does not mean that the data is already structured into a trained test plate for our model training purposes. It just means that all the data that we have here, all the labeled data is inside of the train.csv file where you can see that we have uh, this final prediction feature, which is the survived feature. This is what we're trying to predict. Um, and we have a bunch of other columns here like age and uh, the ticket number that they have and so on and the price that they paid uh, for the ticket and so on. And then we also have the test CSV file, which basically has the same columns except for it doesn't have the survived column. So this is what we have to predict. So this is not the test data set that we use to evaluate our model. This is the actual thing that we need to run our final model on to make the predictions. And then we submit the predictions here on Kaggle to get a score. And then uh, we rank in the leaderboard and so on. And I'm going to tell you a couple of things about the leaderboard afterwards, uh, because there are some things that you need to know there. Uh, but besides that, this is the structure. You have the train CSV file to actually train the model. You have the test CSV file to then um, use the model that you trained to do some predictions. And then you submit the predictions in the following format. We have some example here, the gender submission CSV. Um, you basically just submit the passenger ID and if this person survived or not as a CSV file. And this is then your result. This is what you submit and then you get a score uh, and you rank in the leaderboard. So this data set is also documented quite well. So you can see here that we have the variable survival, P class, uh, sex, age, ticket, fare, and so on. And then what these mean and what kind of values they can have. For example, here embarked, port of embarkation uh, is essentially C means this city, uh, Q means this city, and S means this city. But in a data set, you're not gonna find the full names. So you're only going to find C, Q, S. So here you know what that means. Also, for example, P class here is the uh, socioeconomic status. So it's a proxy for that. You have upper class, middle class, lower class, and based on the value one, two, three, you have the respective class. So you can read into the explanation of the data set into the documentation here. What you need to do in order to participate in that challenge is first of all, you need to create a Kaggle account. This is quite simple. You can even log in with your Google account. Then you go to the overview. You can look at the instructions here, but we're going to go through the whole process in this video anyway, so you don't have to read through this uh, just if you want to. But the important thing is that in order to do this, you need to download the data set. So you go here to download all, and I'm not gonna do that right now actually, but you get the zip file and you can extract the zip file. I already have it. And once you have that, you can get started uh, with the actual work. All right, now what tools you use in order to complete this challenge is totally up to you. You can use a basic text editor, you can use PyCharm, you can use VS Code. I'm going to use a Jupyter Notebook because for data science work, a Jupyter Notebook is just more convenient because you have these individual interactive uh, sections. You don't have to constantly run the whole script. And especially if you have sections where you train the model for five minutes or maybe for two hours, you don't wanna run the full script every time you wanna change something that comes after training the model. So uh, I'm going to use a Jupyter Notebook. However, I'm not gonna make a tutorial here now on how to install the Jupyter Notebook. First of all, there are many tutorials out there. Second of all, I have a video where I explain how to set up Anaconda. And once you have Anaconda set up, you can also use the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and because of that, I'm going to do that. I'm going to navigate into my Titanic directory here, and I'm going to um, say activate data science, which is just an anaconda environment that I'm going to use here. Again, you don't have to do all this. You can just use your ordinary Python with PyCharm and you can just install the respective modules. Now, the modules that we're going to need here today are going to be NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, sklearn, so scikit-learn, also like that, scikit-learn, 
Uh, let me just see what else. Seaborn will be used. And uh, let me just see if I don't miss anything. I think that should be it. So if you want to install all these, you just type pip install and then the libraries like that. So pip install numpy, pip install pandas separately, or you can do it like that uh, as far as I know. And then you have them installed and then you can start your Jupyter Notebook or PyCharm or whatever you're using. And if I start Jupyter Notebook right now here in the Titanic directory, this is going to take a couple of seconds now. Uh, this runs in the browser, as you can see here. And now I can, I, I have my data here. This is basically, first of all, those are some files that I already um, worked with. So those are the files that we get from the Kaggle data set. We have the train CSV, test CSV, and the gender submission, which is basically just showing us the format, doesn't have any important information for us. Um, and you can ignore this notebook. This is just the notebook that I have on my second screen so that I don't skip any steps. If I forget something, I can look it up there. What you need to do here if you're working with a Jupyter notebook is you need to create a new notebook. Um, if you're working with PyCharm, you just type the code directly. And now we're going to start with a very basic uh, exploration of the data set because this is always what you should do first. You should explore the data set. Uh, in order to see, okay, what values do we have? What ranges do we have? Do we have uh, missing values, for example? All this needs to be done. But first of all, we're going to import numpy as np. We're going to import uh, pandas as pd. And we're going to import matplotlib.pyplot as pld. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned this already, but if you want to have vim bindings in the Jupyter Notebook, I have a tutorial on that as well. So you can look that up. Um, and yeah, so basically, if you want to run this cell, you type shift and enter, and then you jump into a new cell, you can also do control enter. Basically, this just imports the libraries now, and we can start by loading the data set into the notebook. So we say Titanic underscore data equals PD read underscore CSV. So we're reading a CSV file using pandas. And the path is data slash train dot CSV. And now we can just display the Titanic data. In a Jupyter notebook, you don't have to uh, type print, you can just type the thing and it's going to show you the data set. Um, and you can see here the different features that we have. Now, some of them are going to be quite irrelevant. For example, I don't think I mean, it's pretty sure to say that probably your name doesn't really influence um, your survival too much. I mean, maybe as a second order consequence. So maybe certain names, certain English names, maybe have a higher social class at the time. Uh, so in a sense, you could say that the name is also related to the personal class, at least to some degree. So maybe we have some correlation there. But I think that it's quite safe to dismiss the name as a significant factor. Also, the ticket number in and of itself is maybe not as important as the fair price that people paid. So the ticket in and of itself is not important, but how much you paid for the ticket may may be important. Um, but this is just an overview over the data set. So if you don't want to see all the lines here, you can just type head, for example. And you can see just the, fir uh, the first five rows. And the important thing is that you understand every value here. So we already talked about the embark, this is basically telling us, okay, which, uh, which city um, did this person enter the ship at or from then we have also the um, social class. But then we also have some some uh, values like these here. What does this mean? SIP SP or P arch. And if you want to know that you just go to the challenge and you go to the data documentation here. And you can see that the SIP SP is the data set defines family relations in this way, sibling equals brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, uh, spouse is husband, wife, um, without mistresses and fiancés. And this basically means if you travel with one of these people. So if you have a brother on the ship as well, you're not alone, you have a brother, for example, this would be a one or I think this is not just a one zero thing, but this is a counter. So I think if you have two brothers, the value is going to be two. If you have two brothers, one sister, uh, one husband, you have four probably. Uh, and then the P arch is basically if you have parents or children on uh, on the boat. So I think again, uh, if you if you're alone, you have a zero here. And if you have like three sons there, you have probably a number three there. Um, we can see if that makes sense by just um, typing 
Was it info? No, it was not info. It was described, I think. Because there we see the ranges of the individual values. And you can see here, P arch, the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is six. So yes, it's a counter. Same goes for this one. So with describe, you can see these uh, individual statistical things here, these key statistics about the individual features, minimum, maximum, mean, and so on. And you can see that um, the maximum number of children slash parents one can have on the boat or the maximum amount that was observed in this training data set is six. And when it comes to siblings and spouses, it's eight. So the maximum value, the mean is quite low. Most people seem to travel alone. Um, so that's that. And the next thing that I think is interesting and important to see is what are the correlations? Because correlation is, of course, not the only thing to look at. You cannot just um, make predictions reliably just on correlation. But it gives you a good idea of, for example, if, if something is highly correlated or even highly negatively correlated to the survival, you know that this is going to be a quite important feature. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say import seaborne as SNS, and we're going to plot a simple correlation heat map by saying SNS dot heat map. And we're going to pass here the Titanic underscore data dot correlation, which or dot core, which gives us the correlation matrix. And as a color map, I like to use yellow, uh, green, blue, I think this is what this stands for. Um, and then we're going to say PLT show. And this is going to give us a correlation heat map indicating uh, the correlation between certain features. And what we're interested in is predicting the survival. So we don't really care, for example, if the age is correlated to your siblings or to having siblings, we're interested in what is correlated to survival. And everything that's negatively correlated is equally interesting as positively correlated. The only thing that doesn't tell us a, a lot is if it's close to zero, because zero means basically it's kind of random, it's not really correlated. One means the higher this value gets, the higher the other value gets. And negative one means the higher this value gets, the lower the other value gets. So it's also significant information uh, to have. And what we can see here is, for example, that the passenger ID doesn't really, you know, it's, it's almost the zero value doesn't really have any connection to the survival. Uh, survival of, is obviously uh, cor correlated with a factor one to survival itself. So this is the diagonal here. Each feature has a correlation of one with itself. Um, and then you can see here that, for example, the personal class or the or the uh, socioeconomic class here uh, is actually highly negatively correlated, which makes sense because this means that the lower the number in P class, the higher the number in survival and survival only has zero and one and P class only has one, two, three. And if we look at the data set, you can see that one is the quote unquote best, the most uh, privileged. I don't know what you say basically uh, with, with the highest socioeconomic status, which means that the lower the number in the P class, so the higher the status, the higher your survival rate. Um, and this can be seen here in the correlation heat map. And also you can see that the more people pay, this is the fair price here, and this is positively correlated, the more people pay for their ticket, uh, the higher the survival chance. And you can also see though, I think at least, yeah, you can see that the class of people and the fair price is itself very correlated. So it makes sense that both are correlated too. So they're negatively correlated, obviously, because the lower the class, uh, or actually the higher the class, but the lower the number of the class, uh, the more people usually pay for the tickets, you can see that with a high negative correlation here. Uh, and because of that, uh, it makes sense that this is positively correlated with survival. Um, besides that, we cannot really see a lot. Um, also, because the gender is not really included here as a numerical value, if we go to the gender, I think, um, maybe we can, where is this? Maybe we can just say, Titanic underscore data. You can see here that it says male, female, 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 male, and so on. It doesn't say one zero. So this might be something that we want to change because we cannot really see a correlation here. We cannot correlate a word with a number. So we have to somehow make this uh, numeric. And um, before we do that, though, we're going to do something that is usually um, done in data science, when you have training and testing data, or when you have a data set, you want to split it into training and testing data. 
and you usually don't want to look at the testing data until you're confident um, with putting your model into production. So you don't want to look at the testing data set in order to not get biased. You want to work only with the training data set and then you want to evaluate with the testing data set. And we're going to do the same thing today. However, in the end, we're going to combine them again into one data set and um, do the actual prediction with the full data because otherwise we would be wasting uh, information. Um, but before we do that, we're going to, or actually in order to do that, we're going to do a stratified shuffle split. This means that what we can do here in order to do a train test split is of course, you know, you just shuffle the whole data, uh, data set and you just pick 80% for training, 20% for testing. This is just what you can do randomly. You just do a random shuffle and you pick 80% for training, 20% for testing. And usually this will work out okay. Probably this will work out okay. However, randomness is randomness. So if things don't go well, you could also have something that's very skewed. It's unlikely, but you can still have a testing data set that looks quite different from the training data set. So it makes sense to pick the uh, pick the features that have a high importance and try to have similar distributions in the training data and in the testing data. And for that, we do a stratified shuffle split. And I'm going to show you how to do that. You basically say from sklearn.model underscore selection, import the stratified shuffle split. And then we basically say the split object is the stratified shuffle split. And we're going to just do one split. So n splits equals one. The test size is going to be 20%, so 0 0.2. And you can define a random state if you want to. I'm not going to define a random state now. And the important thing is that you say now for train indices, test indices, so those are just the indices of um, the data. And what we do now is we say split dot split. So we use the split object to call the split method. And we want to split the Titanic data so that the following features are equally distributed. So we say Titanic data and here we pass survived. We want to have an equal uh, ratio of survived and not survived in both data sets because randomness is random. So what could happen is that we have all the survivals in the training data set and all the not survivals in the test data set or something like that. Um, so we want to make sure this is equally distributed. And we want to also have since this is a highly important feature, the P class, we want this to be um, uh, also well distributed. And we also want to have the gender uh, equally split up. And then this is just a loop. What we do here is we say the strat train set, the stratified train set is essentially the uh, Titanic data set. And we're call calling the lock function here on train indices, this picks out the indices, we can now copy this and change this to test set and this to test indices. All right, so that's that uh, we have a syntax error. What's the problem here? Uh, there you go. And now we can also go ahead and see if this actually worked out. First of all, we can just type strat uh, test set, for example, we can see that we have some values that don't have any order necessarily. But in order to see if the distribution makes sense, we're going to do a plot. So we're going to actually uh, say plt subplot. And we're going to say one to one here. And we're going to plot the strat train set. And we want to know if the sorry, if the survived distribution, so the histogram of the survived, but also the histogram of the P class. If those two things are the same as and this is now in a new subplot, which is um, what was it one, two, two. And here we do the same thing essentially with the test set. And then in the end, we say plt.show. 
And you can see here that now this is maybe not the most professional graph here, but the blue thing or the, 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 the blue bars are essentially the survival and the P class is the orange one. So you can see that uh, they look quite similar and they also look quite similar. So we have a, a similar distribution there, an equal distribution. Now, what's also important to see here is do we have uh, or our, do, do we have for each value that occurs in a data set um, all the values that we need? So if I go, for example, strat train set, do I have any missing values? That's probably a better way of putting it. So we call the info function here and you can see we have 712, 712 and so on. But for example, for uh, not for the gender, for the H, we have 577. So we, the H is missing for a lot of people. The H data is missing for a lot of people. So we need to impute that. We need to somehow deal with that. Now, of course, you can also just drop them. You can just say, okay, drop all the NAND values. We don't care about those. But imputing them with a neutral strategy might be better for the predictions because otherwise you, you, you lose a lot of data, uh, more than 100 uh, rows here, which is not good. And for the cabin... This is probably a, a feature that we're going to drop anyway, so we don't really have to care about this one. And all the things that we're going to do now, we're going to do them as estimators. So this is a little bit more advanced. So maybe you know about imputation. Maybe you know about dropping features. Maybe you know about um, encoding features and so on. But we're going to do this now with estimators. So with a class that allows us then to create an object and call fit or actually fit transform to do all that. This is a more professional way of doing that. And we can chain all of these then together into a pipeline. And this is what we're going to do here. We're going to say from sklearn dot base import the base estimator and transformer mix in. Now the base estimator uh, estimator is just a class that uh, we're going to use to define we have fit transform and so on to define a basic estimator, obviously. And transform and mixin is what allows us to automatically mix fit and transform into fit transform without having to define it explicitly. And then we're going to import uh, from sklearn.impute import simple imputer. And impute basically means, okay, we have missing values. We want to fill them. How do we fill them? What strategy do we use? For example, we can take the mean. We can just take some random value. There are different strategies for that. We're going to use just the mean. And the first class is going to be the H imputer so that we fill up these missing values here. H imputer extends from base estimator and from transformer mixin. And then we say def init self, uh, or actually we don't need init, sorry. We need only fit and transform. So self, and here we pass X and Y, Y has the default value of none. And since we don't really have to do any fitting here, we're just going to return the self object because this is what a fit function has to do. It has to return the base estimator itself and the transform actually does the transformation. So self on X and what we want to do X is our pandas data frame. In this case, this is how we're going to structure this. We're going to say imputer equals simple imputer with the strategy being equal to mean. And then we're going to say x h equals imputer dot fit transform x h with an additional bracket here. There you go. So and of course, we need to return x. Otherwise, we won't get any results. So what do we have here? Not sklearn imputer, but sklearn impute. And that works. So the second thing that we want to do is we want to encode certain features um, numerically. So for example, we, we don't want to have here the feature names, what was it CGQ or something, um, or CSQ or something, we want to have numbers, or we want to have actually what we want to have is we want to have columns that are binary. So we want to have binary features that have zero or one. Um, this is called one hot encoding in machine learning. So we have a feature with four possible values, which is one column. So embarked, for example, can have um, CSQ. Those are three possible values. And instead of having that, we're transforming that into three binary features called C, 
um, S and Q, and they can be zero or one. This makes it easier for our models to handle these features. Um, and for that, we're going to say from sklearn dot preprocessing import one hot encoder. And we're going to do the same thing with uh, the, or are we going to do the same thing with the gender? Or should we go with, uh, actually, we're going to do the same thing with the gender as well. We're going to one hot encode the gender as well, so that we have uh, male, female in separate columns, and then zero, one. And the class for that is going to be called a feature encoder, also going to be a base estimator and transformer mixin like that. The fit function is going to take self x, y equals none. Going to return self again, and then the transform self x. Again, we have the data frame here. And you have to think about this as a pipeline. We get the data set, and what we do is we feed it into the age computer. This returns the imputed ages in the data set, or the data set with the imputed ages. We feed it into the feature encoder we get it with the encoded features, then we feed that into the next thing and so on. This is a pipeline in machine learning. Um, and we're going to transform that now the following way, we're going to say the encoder is a one hot encoder. And the matrix or the matrix we're going to create here is going to be encoder dot fit transform, and we're going to take the array and what we want to do here is we want to transform the embarked and this is going to be turned into an array. Now you might think, okay, why make it so complicated? Why use matrix and uh, why use the loop that I'm going to write here in a second? You can do that in different ways. But the problem is that sometimes you work with data frames, sometimes you work with NumPy arrays, there are many ways to do that. You can also try to find out, uh, try to figure out a better way. This is definitely not the, the cleanest way to do that. It's just a way that I chose, I take the matrix and then I iterate through the columns. Uh, I transpose the matrix to do that. And then I just uh, set this column by column. Uh, for that, I first of all, define the column names. And the possible column names that we have here are C, S, Q, and also N, which uh, happens, I think, in some cases where we don't have a value or something like that. I'm not even sure when this happened. But I think this was a special value that can also occur. Um, and then what we say is we say for I in range length of matrix T. So we flip it transposing means that uh, we basically flip the dimensions. And what we do here is we basically just say that x, the data frame that we're dealing with column names at the position I is going to be the same as matrix dot T. The only reason why we do that is because the format is a different one. So in order to get this into the right format, we need to flip the axes or swap the axes. Um, and that's essentially it. This is how we do that. Now we're going to do the same thing for the gender. So column names equals female, male, and then for I in range length matrix dot T. And of course, I forgot to do that. So matrix equals encoder fit transform the same here with the gender. And that is that. All right, so then we do the same thing. X column names I is matrix transposed I. And in the end, we return X. So we impute the ages that are missing, and then we encode these one hot encode these. So we turn the individual possible values into binary columns into binary features, each a column with zero or one values. We do that for the gender and for the embarked because those uh, are relevant features. And then finally, we're going to drop some features that are not so important. So we're going to call this feature dropper, also a base estimator transformer mix in fit self x y equals none return self def transform self x 
And here we just return x dot drop and we drop embarked because we now have the one uh, the one hot encoded columns, we drop the name, we drop the ticket, we drop the cabin, we drop the gender that we had up until now, and we drop the end column, which is basically irrelevant, but can happen uh, to come into existence based on this year. Um, and then we also specify that we want to do this column wise. So we're not dropping rows, but columns access one. And since sometimes some of these are not going to be available. So for example, n might not even be there. This will cause some error. And because of that, we're going to say errors equals ignore. Maybe also not the cleanest way to do that. So those are the three estimators that we're going to use in the pipeline. And the pipeline we're going to define it right now. We're going to import from sklearn.pipeline import pipeline. And a pipeline is going to be a pipeline object. And here we pass now the H imputer. This is just a name here, which is going to be the H imputer object. Um, and I think we need to pass actually a list of tuples here. Then we have the feature encoder, feature encoder. Um, there you go. And then we have the feature dropper. There you go. All right, so this is the pipeline. And now what we can do is we can run the whole data set if we didn't mess anything up through the pipeline, and it's going to go through all the things. So the data set right now, remember, uh, we have H missing, or some H, H values missing, we have features that we don't want to have. And uh, we also have the gender and the embarked not as binary values. Now this should change if we now call uh, strat train set equals pipeline dot fit transform. So this function calls the fit transform functions of all these uh, individual components, all these estimators, and then it runs through all the estimators through the pipeline, so to say. And what we get as a result here is now our new train uh, strat train data set. Let's see what this looks like strat train set. And you can see now that we have female male as separate columns, we have CSQ as separate columns, uh, and the H should also be um, imputed. So we're going to call now strat train set dot info. And you can see that we don't have any non null values anymore, uh, or we only have non null values anymore, we don't have any NAN values uh, for the H anymore. So this worked very well, we're now going to scale all this, we're going to to use the data that we got here now from the pipeline, we're going to scale it, and then we're going to start with the actual training. So we're going to say from sklearn dot preprocessing import standard scalar. And we're going to say scalar equals sk or actually not sklearn, just standard scalar like that. And then x underscore data is going to be scalar fit transform x and y data is just going to be y two underscore numpy because we don't want to uh, scale the survival. But the numerical features should be scaled because that usually makes it easier for the models to handle. And the result of all those, or the reason why we call two NumPy here is because the scalar returns a NumPy array, we need NumPy arrays. Um, and this also returns a NumPy array. So now we have uh, x is not defined, why is x not defined? Oh, because I didn't even do that yet. Sorry, x equals um, Titanic data or actually strat train set drop the survived column. on axis one and y is basically only that survived column. Now it works. And now we have the data as a numpy array here, as you can see, no longer as a pandas data frame. So essentially, we now have the data in the format that we want. And all we need to do is we need to train a model, we need to evaluate this model, 
uh, until we're confident, we need to train the model again on the full data and then we need to submit the predictions as a CSV file. Uh, and what kind of model you choose here, what kind of algorithm you choose is up to you. You can go with a k-nearest neighbors classification, you can go with a support vector classification. I'm going to use a random forest classifier because I think that this um, decision structure here can be modeled as a decision tree and a random forest classifier is basically uh, a classifier that uses multiple decision trees to make a decision. So I'm going to use that, but again, you can use whatever you want. You can also use a neural network if you think that it's going to get you more results or better results. Um, but yeah, so we're going to import here sklearn and sample from sklearn and sample. We're going to import the random forest classifier. And we're going to import from sklearn dot model selection the grid search CV. Now, for those of you who don't know what the grid search CV is, CV stands for cross validation. The idea is quite simple. You have 100% of your data and uh, you split it into 10 folds, for example. This is what it's called, folds. Um, and what you do is you take nine of those folds, train them all on those nine and you test it, you evaluate it on um, the one fold that's remaining. And you do that with all possible combinations. So you take all nine, uh, all different variations of that so that um, there's always each of these folds was used once for validation. Um, and this is what you do to validate your model. So you don't do that with a test data set. You do that inside of the training data set. You split it into validation data sets. And the grid search uses cross validation. So what I just explained to find the optimal hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are stuff uh, like, for example, in the k nearest neighbors classification, you can specify how many neighbors to look at, for example, or if you want to do some weighting, for example. Uh, weighing, for example, and if you want to do that, um, you have different parameters, uh, or different different values that you can pass for these parameters. And if you want to find the most optimal parameters, you can run a grid search that uses cross validations, uh, cross validation with the different combinations of uh, these uh, parameters of these hyperparameters. Um, and essentially, this is what we're going to do now, we're going to define the classifier to be a random forest classifier. And we're going to define a so called parameter grid, grid, a param grid. Um, and here we have this dictionary, or actually, this is a list of dictionaries. But we're going to only have one dictionary in here. And these are the parameters that we can pass to the random forest classifier. So for example, and estimators, for that, of course, it makes sense to look up the, um, the documentation for the random forest classifier. So for the estimators, we're going to use 10, 100, 200, and 500. So basically, the grid search CV is going to uh, do cross validation using the random forest classifier with all these values. So it's going to try all the different combinations of values to evaluate um, the model. And then we're going to also have max depth, we're going to have none, five and 10. And then we're going to have min samples split two, three, four. So this means that, for example, the grid search CV is going to build a random forest classifier with n estimators set to 10, max depth set to five, min sample split set to four, for example, and it's going to do all the combinations. So 10, non, two, 10, non, three, 10, non, four, 10, five, two, and so on, until we get all the combinations, and then it's going to give us the one that performed the best. And how do we do that? We say grid search equals grid search CV. We pass the classifier, we pass the parameter grid. We say cross validation three, which means that uh, we want to do that with um, with three folds here. Um, then scoring is going to be the accuracy. So how accurate um, are the predictions? And we're going to also return the train score. So we're going to set this to true. And finally, grid search dot fit x data y data. Now, this is going to take some time. So I'm going to run this here, I'm going to cut the video here because this uh, takes time, as I said, and then once we have the result, I'm going to come back to you. Alright, so the grid search now completed. And if we want to get the best results, so the best estimator that was found, we can say, for example, final CLF for final classifier, and then grid search dot best underscore estimator underscore. And then 
we can print that or we can we can get this as a result here and you can see in this case it was the random forest classifier with max depth set to 5 and n estimators set to five, uh, 500 and in this case if you're um, into into actual data science and you want to really get the best model possible you would notice that the n estimators is 500 so it's the maximum value and you would maybe rerun this with a higher value to see if 500 is actually that good or if maybe 1000 is even better than that uh, but now we're just going to accept that. And the next thing we want to do is we want to score this. So we want to to take now the test data set that we have here, the, the strat test set. And we want to run the whole process uh, of the pre-processing on it again. And we want to then uh, score the model, this final classifier on the test set. And for that, we say the strat test set is the pipeline that we defined dot fit transform the test set. And then you can already see because of that pipeline, we already have the right structure here again. All right. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say x equals or actually x underscore test equals and then strats test set dot drop survived axis equals one and y test strat test survived and then x or actually scalar is a new standard scalar and then um, what was it x data test equals scalar dot fit transform x test and then y data test equals y test dot to numpy. There you go. Now we have that. And all we need to do now for the evaluation is final CLF score x data test y data test. So we give it the test data here and we want to see how good the predictions of this model are compared to the actual data. And in this case, we get 0.81, which is 81% accuracy. This is quite good. Um, and all we need to do now is we need to take the findings here so we can see, okay, this kind of worked. If we get that score with the actual data, this would be nice. So we're now going to take all this data and train them all again on all of the data. And then we're going to do the predictions and get hopefully uh, accurate results on, on the actual Kaggle data set. So the first thing we need to do is we need to combine the training and test data again into the final data. And uh, actually, we don't need to combine that because we have the final data. We have the combined data already here, the Titanic data. But we need to run this also through the pipeline because the Titanic data still has the old format where we don't have uh, the one hot encoded features and we also have useless features. So we can say that the final underscore data equals pipeline pipeline dot fit transform. And you can see now why this pipeline is so useful. We, we don't have to write the code all the time. Um, and now we have the final data. And here we can see that the final data now this is everything from zero to 890 with the right format. And then again, of course, we do the same thing. We say basically the x final equals final data drop survived axis one y final equals final data survived and then x data final equals and of course for that scalar standard scalar like that and this is scalar dot fit transform x final and then y data final is equal to y final two underscore numpy there you go now we have that and then again we're going to run uh, the grid search on this whole thing. So we're going to actually copy this here. Let's call this prot underscore CLF or production classifier. 
to sound fancy and the difference here is we keep all this the same but and of course we need to say here prod underscore clf um, and here we just pass x data final and y data final so only the data changes and again i'm going to run this and i'm going to come back to you once it's done all right so this is now done as well and we can move on to the final step we say now prod underscore final underscore clf is grid search dot best underscore estimator underscore let's see what it's this time if it's the same or not no this time it's different max depth five and min sample split three and now we're going to actually make the predictions on the test data so on the csv file that we have here and then we're going to uh, format this in a way that it has the structure of gender submission so let's open this up again to see what it's uh, structured like we basically have just passenger id survived and then just id and yes or no so zero or one this is what we have to submit here 420 lines with one blank line in the end and one header in the top this is our submission um, and for that we're going to say that the titanic underscore test underscore data is pd dot read underscore csv data slash test csv we can see here that it has the same structure but no survived and now we say final test data equals pipeline fit transform quite useful um the titanic test data and now we can see that we have the right structure here as well and now what we do is we turn all this again into a numpy now uh, into a numpy array now the problem that we have here i think we can see that if we call the info function is that we have a non-null uh, or we have a null value so what we're going to do that here uh, what we're going to do in order to counteract this is we're just going to use the fill and a method um, of pandas so what we're going to do is we're going to say x underscore final test is final test data then x underscore final underscore test equals x final test dot fill an ace or fill not a number um, and the method is just going to be f fill which i think is forward fill or something like that basically just taking the next value to impute so we're not going to use an imputer here and besides that we're going to say scalar equals standard scalar and since we don't have uh, the survived information we don't need to do anything with the y here we only have the x so x data final test we can choose different names here as well is scalar fit transform x final test and the predictions are prod final clf predict x data final test what's the problem here x has 12 features but random forest classifier is expecting 11 features as input let me just see if i forgot something here uh we load the csv file we run it through the pipeline we then say oh no this is not the problem yeah this is the problem final underscore test data this is what we need to do here but then we have a different problem here x phi is not defined oh like that right there you go predictions and we can actually look at the predictions here those are just zeros and one uh, once and now we need to create a data frame so final underscore df is pd dot data frame titanic test data and what we want to have here is only the passenger id so we take the series of the passenger id we turn it to a data frame then we say the final df new column here survived is equal to predictions which is an umpire array and then we save that into a csv file to csv 
data slash predictions dot CSV index equals false. So that we don't have an index. And that is essentially it. We can also uh, show this here. There you go. And we're going to we're saving it without the index or so without zero one and so on, which means that we now have the prediction CSV file. This is what it should look like. Uh, not the values, but the structure. And here we have the same structure. So this is what we now need to submit to Kaggle. All right, so for the submission, we just go to the challenge page, we go to submit predictions. And then we upload here the CSV file. In this case, it's on my desktop Titanic data prediction CSV. And you can of course also describe some stuff here, you can also write a Jupyter notebook if you want to, but you can just uh, make the submission. And then you're going to get a score. In this case, we get 0 0.78. So 78.468% uh, accuracy. This ranks us at where are we? Do you see your own rank? There you go. 2136. Now, not necessarily good, or not necessarily the best score that you can have, but I think it's decent. The one thing that I wanted to mention here is that you're going to see a lot of one scores here. Now, you can basically dismiss those, you can also click on them and see the comments, they basically say the same thing. You can dismiss all of those because if you have 100% here, if you have anything close to 100% here, on this particular challenge, you either use the full data set for training, so you cheated by using different data, not the data provided here, or you just submitted the correct data right away from the actual data set from the full data, uh, data set, or you tricked in any other way, but you probably didn't do it honestly. And none of these people that have a 100% score here have a Jupyter notebook to show how they did it with the data. And the challenge here is not to get the highest score, the challenge is to get the highest score with the data that you get. So of course, you can just research the Titanic data set and get the full data set, and then just, you know, upload the, the correct data as a CSV file. But the task here is to take the data that you are provided with so that that is given to you, and then make the best out of it and make the best possible predictions. Probably you can do that by combining models using maybe neural networks, even though I'm not sure if this is going to help a lot. Uh, but whenever you see someone having one as, uh, as an accuracy here, this is probably cheated. So you can dismiss those. Also, if someone has 99.999% probably cheating. Um, if someone has a very high score, maybe an unbelievably high score, they might just be lucky, but one is very, it's almost impossible that they're actually legit when they get 100%, unless they brute force it, right? So maybe random entries until they got 100%, uh, but even then it's quite uh, unlikely. So if you rank around, 70 plus 75, maybe 80, you're you're quite fine. And this is how you submit Kaggle challenges. This is how you predict Titanic survivors using uh, using machine learning in Python. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know if you want to see more uh, such Kaggle challenges or data science projects. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.